Hi guys, today I will talk about the upcoming GPU architectures from AMD, in particular Polaris, but most of this will relate to Vega as well. Firstly, before the technical stuff starts, I'll cover some basics. AMD plans to replace the current 300 and Fury series with Polaris 11 and 10 sometime around the middle of this year. The most current info is a launch at Computex later this month and AMD recently confirmed they are on track. Polaris 11 will target the entry or value segment and Polaris 10 will aim at the mainstream segment. An example of entry level GPUs are the NVIDIA 750Ti or the 950 or AMD 360 and 370. These are low power and low price cards, usually $149 or below. The lower the power the better in general as they are more compatible as upgrades for pre-built PCs from the likes of Dell or HP and this is because these PCs usually have weak power supplies or poor airflow. For mainstream we're talking about GPUs such as the AMD 280, 380 or the Nvidia 960. In general both AMD and Nvidia consider $299 or below to be mainstream. So when AMD talks about mainstream we can already figure out the price target they are aiming for and it's well below the mid-range or performance segments which the Pascal 1070 and the 1080 are priced at. The obvious question here is if AMD is aiming to sell Polaris 10 for mainstream prices, does it mean that it lacks performance to compete with the mid-range Pascal 1070? As far as we know, the 1070 will have similar performance to Titan X, the current top GPU from Nvidia. I suspect in gaming performance in general it would be slightly below Titan X, and this is likely due to GDR5 bandwidth limitations along with the cut down chip potentially having less than the full 256 bit memory controllers, a similar situation to the 970. Right, what kind of performance can we expect from Polaris 10? For this we have to make an educated guess. Historic trends in general are a good predictor, so let's examine the last time AMD transitioned to a new node as well as a new architecture. Meet Pitkan or the AMD 7870, a small mainstream chip which packed a lot of performance for its size, power and price. This comparison is even more interesting because Pitkan is actually very similar to Polaris 10 in size and estimated power profile. We can see that the 7870 delivered performance that beat AMD's previous top GPU, the 6970, which in today's tech would be equivalent to the 390X. Pitkan also came very close to Nvidia's big GPU, the GTX 580, which is the Titan X equivalent. Unless there's a major problem, we can expect Polaris 10 to be significantly faster than Hawaii GPUs such as the 390X and can match the Fury X, Titan X or in this case the new Pascal 1070. This may sound too amazing for some of you, but let's examine why this is not only possible but quite normal and realistic. Firstly, Polaris 10 is produced on a mature 14 nanometer FinFET node at Global Foundries and Samsung. This node has been in production for a long time already, producing highly clocked chips for Apple. In fact, Samsung claims that the node is performing very well with good yields. For Polaris, what this means is most of the chips produced will be defect free and so they have more full chips to select the good ones that can hit the clock speeds needed. Comparing Samsung 14 nanometer versus TSMC 16 nanometer, we can see a unique flavor between these two nodes. It could be said that 14 nanometer is more dense, that it packs more transistors by area, but it clocks slightly less. While not a 100% accurate comparison, this trend is at the transistor level and so we can expect that at least some of this will carry over to AMD and also Nvidia. We've already seen with 16 nanometer, Pascal clocks very high when compared to 28 nanometer. The 1080 is reported to boost close to 1.9 GHz on stock and also overclocks to above 2.1 GHz. So what kind of clock speeds can we expect from the top Polaris chips? Probably close to 1.5 GHz due to the 14 nanometer FinFET as well as the GCN architecture, which generally clocks lower than Nvidia's. Note that AMD's top GPUs currently clock around 1 GHz, so we're talking potentially a 50% increase in clock speeds. Think about what would happen if you take a 390, for example, and shrink it to 14 nanometer FinFET, and you clock it a lot higher, right? But this isn't the only thing that AMD is doing with Polaris. AMD's goal with Polaris is to increase IPC or instructions per clock, a term that is usually used for CPUs. What it really means is that the architecture itself can perform better per shader at the same clocks, i.e. one Polaris shader delivers more performance than one Hawaii or Fiji shaders. Let's examine some of the ways which AMD can improve IPC. Firstly, AMD will improve the hardware scheduler or the command processor. One of the problems for AMD in particular on current APIs such as DirectX 11 is a non-optimal shader utilization. 
When AMD designed GCN, it was made for an API that can take advantage of all the hardware schedulers on the architecture, both the command processor and the asynchronous compute engines or ACES. On consoles, this was never an issue because the low-level API there can fully utilize GCN's hardware schedulers. On the PC, however, because DirectX 11 is a serial single-engine API that doesn't even recognize the ACES. This is the major reason why Fury X, despite having around 45% more shaders than the 390X, really only performs around 20% higher. As you lower the resolution to say 1080p, this performance lead shrinks, because the shaders are completing their work items faster than the command processor is able to keep up. Some people think that Fury X is rasterizer or ROP bottlenecked, and this is false. At 4K, we see Fury X lead over the 390X grows. There's more pixels to fill, so being rasterizer bound will result in the opposite, where higher resolution result in low performance. The problem with Fury X is that it uses the same front end as Hawaii or Tonga, in that it's got a single command processor, but now it has many more shaders, which it cannot feed properly. What this means for Polaris is that by having an improved command processor, it leads to a higher shader utilization. Thus, per shader, performance goes up, especially for DirectX 11 games. A new feature that AMD highlighted in Polaris is the instruction prefetch. Prefetch in general serves as a mechanism to reduce wait states. It can work in a few ways. It can prefetch and cache frequent occurring instructions, so when it's needed, it can be fetched and processed quicker. It can also prefetch and cache textures, which are texture elements. The result is a higher overall sustained performance with less drops due to CPU or memory bandwidth bottlenecks. Hardware prefetch is actually a very difficult thing to pull off correctly, because if it doesn't prefetch the correct items to cache, it can lead to a performance loss. However, GPU rendering is an in-order process, so robust hardware prefetch should lead to some nice gains. One side effect of this feature relates to AMD's weakness in DirectX 11, where the single CPU rendering thread can be choked and so instructions to the GPU can be erratic. This feature can function as an advanced instruction buffer. What this means is that during game scenes where the CPU can be bottlenecked, Polaris 10 should perform better than previous GCN. The most talked about feature so far in Polaris is the primitive discard accelerator, and this is probably due to the fancy name. It really is all about culling and removing information that is not visible to the current field of view. There's many ways to do this, and it can involve software on the game engine level as well as fixed hardware on the GPU. At the game engine level, there's a wide variety of culling techniques, some of which are performed by the CPU, while others are compute shaders running on the GPU. Advanced engines such as Crytek and Frostbite routinely use GPU compute-based culling. Despite taking up shader time, DICE claims and use of compute shader culling leads to a 20% performance gain for Star Wars Battlefront. Because there's a few ways that AMD could have implemented this feature, it's too much of an unknown to nail down. It could be a simple enhanced fixed function feature, or an entirely new unit which offloads the compute-based culling step, performing it quicker and also freeing up the shaders to render graphics. What it really comes down to is this is a performance boost, particularly during complex scenes with lots of objects hidden from view. An example is Polaris 10 running the demo of Hitman at 1440p, achieving a solid 60 frames per second. The scene itself appears quite simple outside of a mock ship, but it's actually misleading because there's hundreds of highly detailed NPCs on that boat. It's the perfect scenario for the primitive discard accelerator to discard most of those NPCs from being rendered, thus resulting in a huge performance gain. Note that culling in general is more beneficial as scene complexity increases, as such this feature may not be useful in some games. However, in more complex games or more demanding scenes that would cause a performance drop, having an accelerated culling can lead to a higher minimum frames per second. We can see that AMD is really chasing at very small wins here. Together, these new features add up to improve shader utilization and overall performance of Polaris. So what's my verdict for Polaris 11 and 10? For the full uncut chips, Polaris 11 should have 20 compute units or 1280 shaders, less than 75 watts and performance around the 380X for about $149. Polaris 10 should be 40 compute units, or around 2,560 shaders. Less than 150 watts, performance around Fury X level, for around $299. If you thought this video was informative, please share and hit subscribe. Thanks.